Well, um, today we're going to be talking about Psalm 23 together to talk about how the Lord is our good shepherd. Now, we're going to be going through it together, so if you brought your Bible, you can open up to that. We're going to be taking it in its sections, so that's verses 1 to 3 is one section, and then verse 4, and then verse 5, and then verse 6, if you want to follow along. And um, since we're going through it together, I'm going to read it again, although you did a really great job. Let's give him a hand. He did good. I'm going to read it again because we're going to be going through it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Something I want to point out in that first section, verses 1 to 3, is something that happens in verse 2. It says something interesting. It says that he leads me. Now, what does it mean that he leads me like a shepherd? In the Old Testament, leaders were often depicted as shepherds. I want to go through a couple of verses to prove that to you. Genesis 48, 15 says that Jacob called on God, who has been the shepherd of his life all the day long, even to this day. Numbers 27, 17 says, Moses didn't uh, want Israel, when he had died, to be as sheep without a shepherd. In 2 Samuel 5, 2, the Lord said to David, you shall be the shepherd of my people, Israel. And Psalm 77, 20 again says, God led Israel like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So it's true. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. But in a particular kind of way. Did you know that there's a difference between the way that shepherds take care and lead their flocks in the east and in the west? Are you aware of this? In the west, when shepherds are leading their sheep, they drove them, they're behind them. They corral them and drive them from one place to another. That's how they lead them. But in the east... The shepherds are out front. They lead from the front. And they don't turn around to see who's gone away. They just simply lead from the front. And the sheep actually follow them by the sound of their voice. Isn't that interesting? This actually reminds me of one of my favorite anecdotes. It's about um, a tour guide in Israel who was leading a tour. And he was actually explaining this phenomenon to all these Westerners that were in his bus, you know. And to their delight, after he had explained this, a flock of sheep started to come by. And so they're all excited. You know, they just learned something cool. And so they look out there, and then all of a sudden they start to snicker. And they start to chuckle. And he's wondering why. He's feeling a little sheepish, and they said, you should look out the window. So he looks out the window of the bus, and there is a flock of sheep with the guy behind. And he's like, friend, what are you doing? Aren't you the shepherd? Why aren't you in the front? He says, oh, I'm not the shepherd. I'm making all of these into mutton. He was the butcher. Can you believe that? feeling very vindicated and then feeling very frightened, they just moved along. (laughs) I think that this difference actually, though, teaches us something about how the Lord is our shepherd. See, in Psalm 23, it's trying to show you this, that God goes ahead of you. We follow him and we listen to his voice. We listen to his word. Jesus is our shepherd Just listen to what he says in John chapter 10, the first five verses. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought out all of his own, 
he goes before them and they follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow but they flee from him for they do not know the voice of a stranger. See, Jesus doesn't drive us to a certain end and he's not trying to make mutton out of all of us. (laughs) Instead, Jesus wants us to live. And that's why he leads us. He has gone ahead of you in so many things in your life, hasn't he? I mean, think about those times when you were filled with anxiety and you prayed to God and he had already met you where you were going and you were filled with a great sense of relief. He's gone ahead of you in life to lead you. And he'll meet you in wherever you go. This is exactly what he promised to his disciples after his resurrection. Do you remember that? He said, go tell my disciples that I've gone ahead of them into Galilee. That's where they can meet me. He has gone ahead of you in the important things of life. He's even gone ahead of you in the critical things of life. Think about it. He has gone ahead of you in death. Death is something that we will face, but Jesus has already gone ahead of us there. That's why he went to Calvary, so that he might conquer death and provide a safe way through death for you. And so you don't even have to be afraid about that because he is the one who can bring you safely through that. And think about it. He's gone ahead of you into heaven. Listen to his voice. Follow him. Your shepherd is leading you there. Okay, in verse 4 of Psalm 23, it says, um, it says, I have no fear for you are with me. That's a very important phrase. I have no fear for you are with me. This teaches us that the shepherd saves us. Now, what does he save us from? He saves us from the valley of the shadow of death. And that's why we fear no evil, right? So he saves us from death and evil. Well, we know who saves us from death and the evil of sin, don't we? Speaking of being a good shepherd, listen to what Jesus says again in John chapter 10, verses 7 to 18. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to pick it up again. Isn't that great? Listen, in verse 14, I don't know if you caught it, in verse 14 it says, I know my own, and my own know me. Well, how did you come to know Jesus? How did you come to believe in him? Well, you might remember the song of Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It was his word. That's what taught you to listen to the voice of Jesus in the gospel. And when you heard the voice of Jesus in the gospel, you believed in him. And so how did he save us? Well, it's uh, verses 17 and 18. Can I read them again, Mike? Would that be okay? Mike has given permission. There you go, folks. All right, listen to what it says in verses 17. How does he save us? He says, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to pick it up again. That's 
how the shepherd saves us from death and evil. He laid it all down to protect the flock. He lays down his life and he picks it up again in resurrection power. But of course, you remember this because we just had Good Friday and Easter. Can you believe that was just like yesterday, right? And so you know this good news. He died on the cross to save us and then three days later, he was resurrected again to give us that promise forever. Okay, something really interesting happens in John 10, uh, John, um, 10 verses 19 to 21, right after Jesus like, shares all of this, I'm the good shepherd stuff. The interesting thing is that the flock of people who were gathered around him after he had said this began to, well, fight. Isn't that weird? Because Jesus has given a good teaching, and their only reaction is to fight. Okay, I'm going to read what it says. It says, There was again a division amongst the people because of these words. And many of them said, he has a demon, dude, he's insane. Literally what it says. Why listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Isn't that crazy? Now you might be saying to yourself, how very unlamb like sheep. Sheep aren't divisive, right? unless you've seen an episode of Clarkson's Farm, right? You know that sheep can be divisive. They are. Okay, how many of you have ever seen this image before? Anybody seen this one? Only three people. That's wild. Okay, a couple more over here. This is the classic stained glass window of like Jesus is the good shepherd. Ironically, also, you see the sheep over here are perfectly divided into like butcher's meat. Do you see that? Isn't that weird? Like you can't unsee that now, right? <laughs> but then look, Jesus has that little lamb in his arms. And this is a, a powerful illustration. It's a powerful image when you consider that it also illustrates something that Pastor Craig talked about a while back. There's this phenomenon that happens in flocks of sheep called the bummer lamb. And this is how it works. Often, in a flock of sheep, they'll give birth to a lamb, and all of the sheep of that flock actually reject it. Isn't that sad? And like, they'll do crazy things like kick that little lamb, and they'll try and squish it, and they'll like shoulder it up against the pen. It is literally the saddest thing in the world, right? But when a good shepherd sees that bummer lamb, and that's why they call it a bummer lamb, what he does is he picks it up and he keeps it to himself and he feeds it and he nourishes it and it sleeps on his chest, it hears his heartbeat and he speaks to this lamb and as this lamb gets stronger, he then reintroduces it back into the flock. And when he does that, they accept it because it's no longer a bummer lamb, it's the shepherd's lamb. Isn't that kind of sweet? Now, when the shepherd comes calling to his sheep, you got to know, the first one to always greet him is the bummer lamb because it knows the shepherd's voice. Psalm 23, verse 5 is correct. Listen to what it says again. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. It is correct for every bummer lamb. He prepares a table before them in the presence of their enemies. The care and comfort of the shepherd is an anointing oil marking them. And every time they hear the shepherd's voice, their cup runneth over. Okay, now we're at the end of Psalm 23. And here's a verse that I always have trouble with. It's verse six. Listen to what it says. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know, I just think that the way that people commonly read follow me doesn't actually follow the force of the words of what the Hebrew's trying to get at. All right, you ready? Everybody say, Radhaf. You won't need a tissue afterwards. It's okay to say it. Everybody say, Radhaf. 
That's the Hebrew word here that, me, that is translated as follow me. Now, I'm not saying that it's an error. I just want you to catch the nuance of the Hebrew word. When we think of follow, we think of passive widow puppies, don't we? Isn't that what you think of? Like, come follow, come here, you know? But this word is actually active. It says, I'm following you intently, like a dad does when his daughters are on their first date to take care of them. Better yet, it says that I'm chasing you. Better still, it says I'm pursuing you, but not in a creepy bad way, all right? Remember, he's a good shepherd. He's not a creepy bad shepherd. And just look at... All you have to do is look at the Old Testament way that God describes himself as a shepherd pursuing after his sheep. It's it's Ezekiel 34, it's 11 to 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing because you're like, seriously. All right, but I'm just going to hit some highlights. Is that okay? I have permission. All right, this is what it says. Although I heard a no, that was fun. All right, (laughs) this is what it says. Thus says the Lord, I... I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock. I will rescue them for the places where they had been scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them from the peoples. I will gather them. I will feed them. I will feed them with good pasture. I myself will be their shepherd, of, the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them to lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up, and I will strengthen. Do you hear the force of those words? But listen, it's important that we hear those words because he has to pursue us because of our habit of getting lost. Can I get an amen there? We are prone to wander from the Lord. But remember what Jesus says of himself in Matthew 18, 12 to 14, when he's speaking about a good shepherd who leaves the 99 just to find that one lost one. And isn't that us? Aren't we sometimes just like that one lost one? We are prone to wander and stray, but thank God that in his mercy and in his goodness, he pursues us every single day of our lives. And following is now what we do, but only after he first pursues us. And because of that, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen.